Now, hello. <laughs> um, but what we will be talking about today is your more um, the disabilities that will affect the way that you work in clinic. Um, so hi if you don't know me my name's emma um i have i've been a kinesiologist i've been a kinesiologist for um a long time now uh since 2007. um i began my career so i studied at the college of complementary medicine i did the bachelor of health science on top of that but when I graduated, I was asked to work with the principal there and all of a sudden found myself at a really young age thrown into a world that I kind of hadn't had a lot of contact with. So I'd grown up with autistic, um, sorry, friends who were autistic and Down syndrome and, and family friends, but there wasn't a lot of disability around where, where I grew up. And it wasn't necessarily even something that I wanted to work with. And then all of a sudden I found myself thrown into this world and I loved it. Um, and then, you know, just these little moments across my life where I found myself accidentally working in the realm of disabilities. Um, you know, I, when I was building my business, I was working as a nanny and in childcare and I worked in this thing called the Sunrise Program, um, which is for um, autistic uh, kids to learn how to talk and you know, interact. And then I was exposed to all the other therapies along the way. So it was, it's, it's been a big learning curve. And then of course in clinic, it's just something that seems to naturally arise. So um, why I wanted to talk to you as kinesiologists, I guess, is because I wanna be able to be a little bit more specific because when we work as, um, when we work as kinesiologists with disabilities, you, you don't really muscle test. And this might be a little bit like, what? <laughs> um, but if you think about it, muscle testing isn't really what a kinesiologist does. Our role as kinesiologists is to find stress and tension and locked trauma in the body and help the body to express that. We don't really fix anything. Um, we just allow the body to talk. And one tool that we have is muscle testing, but most of the time with disabilities, there's, that's not uh, the most productive and easy way to communicate with the body. So it, it becomes a whole different realm of working. Um, and what I'm going to say here is that you can trust, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, Surrogacy is something that some people really resonate with and some people don't. I'm one of more on the don't aspect, particularly with disabilities, because there is so much mixed trauma between the carer, like the parent or the carer, whoever you're using, and the person with disability. So no matter how old that child or adult is, there's so much mixed in there as far as trauma goes that you, I don't feel like we can ever really get clear on what's what. So if you're one of those people that really resonate with it and you feel like it's, it works for you, great. Or, you know, you just keep doing you. Um, but I'm just telling you from my experience and, and my way of working. So feel free to take or leave anything I say in here as well. Um, so, okay, um, sorry, I'll answer that question in a little bit. Um, so when we're talking about disabilities, I'm talking about, you know, your intellectual disabilities, your severe autism where you're not, uh, your nonverbal meltdowns, all of that kind of thing. Um, Down syndrome, um, cerebral palsy, you know, again, cerebral palsy is, um, it can fall into the intellectual disability, but, it, you know, a lot of the time it doesn't. Um, it's just a, uh, it's, it's a fully grown mind in a body that, that has difficulties. Um, 
so we're so it's you know you we can talk about working with people in wheelchairs or who can't move their body paralysis palsy um we can talk about seizures so i'll kind of go into my experience of working and what kind of things to look out for so really again as a, as a kinesiologist our key key thing for working is to find what the body's trying to communicate and often with disabilities the verbal communication is is difficult and even trying to process what i'm feeling what i'm thinking what's going on in life is quite difficult so you're usually part of a team and we've got often in disability work we've got your OTs and your speech pathologists and, you know, your physios and you've got all these people who are training the body and the mind. So as a kinesiologist, I kind of try and come in as an, as, as someone who's not trying to train the mind, but unlock what's already there, if that makes sense. So I'm trying to release as much trauma as possible in the body. So the way I do that is I find trauma. Um, and I think really when, when we're not muscle tip, when we're not so focused in our mind on finding the really specifics, you can explore. And a lot of what I do with disabilities is a lot of body work. One, it's really calming to have touch and feel safe and two you can find a lot of information from the body when you really listen and touch um, so i start with um just feeling along the main parts of the body you know you've got the feet the ankles the wrists the head um, and you can generally you can feel what feel the tension in the body and if you allow yourself to listen to that tension in the body you can feel what's underneath it so what i mean is okay say i'm using the wrist for example and we know that there's a lot of acupuncture points here you've got the reflexes that are often held in the wrist um, you've got a lot of tension that, that holds in the wrist you know in an emotional tension so this is often the really safe, easy part to work with with someone with disabilities and you can find out a lot. So yes, you can go to all the acupuncture points, right? And, and feel into those. Generally, I just massage across, right? And I hold. So you get the palm of your hand and you hold. And whether you use pulse, energy, fascia, it's all kind of the same. You're kind of feeling what that tension is and the emotion behind it. So that's really what we do as kinesiologists, right? We, we finding tension, we're finding the emotion behind it and then we're allowing it to release. So a lot of the time what we're doing is we're verbalizing um, how, how someone feels. So when I've worked with, um, you know, a, a great I'm going to use a lot of examples here so I was working with a child with autism once he was verbal but um not you know he was <laughs> the way I just and I might throw a little bit of a spanner him but the way I describe autism and Asperger's is that as you know the difference for me and what I've kind of found is that the difference is that Asperger's usually want to interact with the world. Whereas autism is really happy being in their own little world, <laughs> you know, so it, so it's kind of that for me, that's that difference. Um, but if you want to throw out an alternative, that's absolutely fine. But so, so with Asperger's, I'm often trying to get them to understand or process social events that's been happening. With autism, I'm usually just trying to express how they feel about something, if you can get the difference with that. So um, what I'm often doing is I'm getting them to, well, I'm getting them to lie on the table and they've often got their own devices. Um, 
they want to focus in on okay i might start from the beginning because i've kind of jumped right in but if you don't mind i'm going to start from the beginning so when you're working with um an autistic child like a severely autistic child or intellectual impairment or down syndrome or something along those lines where the world is quite overwhelming for them you come in and there's going to be a moment of they're going to need to get their bearings and they're going to need to get um, control of the situation so one of the biggest concerns i think for therapists is how to handle the meltdowns that can happen in clinic and a meltdown will happen when they don't understand what's happening when there's been too much or when there's been too much to process really quickly so you've got to take your time and you've got to explain to them exactly what's going on um, so they come in and they'll sit down and they'll often you know be in their zone and i don't take that zone away because they're they're still you know there's it's very rare that they're not listening while they're on their devices right they they're still engaged in the world it's just that they're trying to bring focus because if they unfocus their mind it's too much to to like it's too i don't know where and it's all of a sudden really overwhelming so if we bring ourselves in here um then we can focus and we can we can actually calm down and there's for me there's a threshold like there's a threshold when that becomes too much stimulation but actually under that threshold i find it a, a handy tool for instance um i had a girl the other day with really really severe tourette's and the only way she could stop herself from ticking for a moment like just she just needed a breath from her ticks um she would she would focus on the ipad um so after the ipad i do what's called a tech rub down so basically i just do a proprioception rub where you deeply squeeze all of the joints and it's like you bring them back into their body a bit but as far as the mind goes if they're on their devices they're often sorry i thought that was off they're often like zoned in um so they'll come in they're often on their devices and us we'll still talk to them um even though they're on their devices so what i'll say is that we're going to talk for a bit and then i'm going to give you a massage and, and things so remember that most of these kids and adults are used to going to appointments it's been their whole life so um so you know we are it's it's they're quite used to the process here it's more or not are you going to hurt me or not um, and what exactly are you going to do to me? <laughs> Which is a kinesiologist is actually quite hard because we don't know a lot of the time what we're going to do straight off the bat. Um, but what I say is that, you know, we'll chat a little bit, I'll get a bit of background, um, and then I'm going to give you a massage. So in my kinesiology for kids course, I don't know if any of you know that, I've actually got another one running in August, but I go through this thing called a nervous system procedure, which is something that I've kind of developed in my way of working. Um, and I massage the feet, the wrists, and I, and I hold the occiput of the head. And this is often what I do with um, people with disabilities as well. So they'll, they'll come in, they'll be on their iPad and we'll talk, we'll get the info. Um, more often than not, they'll go around and explore the room. So don't have anything breakable, <laughs> um, but let them explore because they're just trying to get a sense of what, what the room is. And, um, what can be really interesting is that if you've got, if they come in again and something's not in its right place or something isn't there, then they're quite disappointed in you, <laughs> um, you know, because it's, this is, this is the place, you know, this is where everything is. This is, I can get a handle on what's happening because everything's the same. Um, and often what will happen is that they're quite used to a certain way that you work. Um, you know, even toddlers that I've got in um, with speech delays and, and things like that, they will, okay, I take off my shoes, I get a foot rub, and now I want you to, like, they'll tell you what they want. Um, 
And so this is why we really don't need muscle testing. But um, as as someone's brought up here, you know, with her son with um, with cerebral palsy, kinesiology is a really good way of helping them to communicate what's going on for them. Um, you know, and if it's not muscle testing, you can feel it or you can use the pendulum or you can do self-testing. Um, but really a lot of the time, if you can get used to reading the feeling of the body, it's really useful. But while you're starting out, you can use the pendulum and self-testing. So sorry, I'm jumping again. I have so much information for you guys. I have so much to give you guys, but, um, so yeah, so what we'll do is we'll get them on and then I'm reading their body. I'm trying to feel where the tension areas are in their body. I'm trying to feel the emotion behind it. And then we talk about it. Okay, you know, this is the, I'm, I'm feeling quite a lot of anger and tension. And then I'm asking the body like in my mind and with the way that I'm working, it's, it's really trying to find where the opening is. So when you're feeling it, it's like, when you find it, you'll find it, it starts to move and you'll find it starts to open. And so I'll be asking, okay, is it at school? Is it at, um, is it at home? Is it with parents? Or we'll just generally ask out loud. And what I'll, so coming back to this story of this, you know, an autistic child, um, he would come in and I would literally just verbalize what he was feeling. And then it's like, they take a deep breath and it's like you watch all of their tension just melt away. It's incredible. And he was like, all right, I'm done now. <laughs> and, he'd, and he'd go. <laughs> um, and, you know, that happens so often um, with, with disabilities. It's like, you know, a lot of their tension comes from wanting to express something but not really having either the ability to process it or express it um, properly. And so it's a lot of the time and understanding once they feel understood and, you know, that's humans as a whole, right? Once we can understand something, it's like, ha, oh, right. Okay. Let go. So again, working with them, working with the agitation that happens in clinic is often because they don't understand what's happening or you've gotten it wrong or you're assuming something or they actually really want to say something. So my biggest tip for working with disabilities is to take your time to really understand um, them and their world and don't jump in and try and um, try and fix things, you know, there's, again, you know, it's not about fixing them. It's about helping them to understand life and the world and helping them process and express what's going on. And that's what our role as kinesiologist is, I think. Um, but do we have any questions going forward? Is there something that you want me to go over before I jump into the next little bit? Um, somebody's put their hand up. Susie, did you want to talk or say something? Um, you, there's a little chat box down the bottom or a Q&A thing. Um, so I'm not, I don't necessarily, oh no, that's okay. So um, I don't, I'm not here to necessarily tell you how to work. I just want you to feel really comfortable with a different way of exploring the body and the mind and, and how things work um, and to become really comfortable with the key kind of difficulties when working in clinic. Again, I, I know this is obvious, um, but I do have to say it, you know, don't talk loud and, and slow to them. <laughs> it's, it's an insult, it, you know, particularly with something like cerebral palsy where it is difficult for them to get the words out sometimes if it's affected their mouth um 
they're not they're no, not stupid. They they have difficulty getting words out, but you don't have to be slow in the way that you respond. <laughs> you talk to them. Um, another thing I'll mention is that if they're bringing in a carer, um, you know, if they've if they've got a if they're often an adult and they've they need carers, um, don't. Um, don't do too much talking with the carer. You know, you can you can ask them general questions here and there, but really make it about um, the person on the table. You might not get them on the table. That's okay. I've got a couch here, chair here, wheelchair. Um, you you make it work. You've got to be really flexible. Uh, with a small child, I'm often doing a session on the floor, running around. Um, you're holding things. You're explaining to them what you're putting on their body. <laughs> I'm going to do this. Is this okay? Look, for me, look, it's a drop of water. Um, if I'm using an essence or something like that, it's like I'm, I'm using a drop of water here. Feel it. Is that okay? Um, I give the option if I'm using oils, you know, do you want this? Don't you want this? Sometimes the smell can be really overpowering. Um, do you like it? Don't you like it? Um, if a child is having, if an autistic child is having a meltdown in your clinic, um, it's a fight or flight response, right? So you crouch down right away, crouch down on the floor and you become silent and you watch and you wait, you know, most of the time they're not going to destroy things. Um, they can, it's okay right? It's okay. Um, your main thing is to not make this wrong or more scary or to enter their space. Um, let them process. And if they need, if the fight or flight, so the, what happens in a fight or flight response is that flight will happen first. They will want to get out first. So you will notice this. So one, they'll start working off one and a half speed. I say that their movements get all jerky they'll start looking towards the door. They'll start asking when this is going to be finished. Um, if you give them permission in flight mode to release that energy and to find safety, then you won't get fight mode. It's only when someone's backed into that corner in flight mode and you're not letting me escape that fight mode's going to come out. So if I'm working with a child on the table or an adult on the table and I can feel that flight energy starting to happen, I will literally, like I've got kids that I'll say, okay, hands up. And they will jump from the table to the couch. They'll go and sit on the couch for a little bit. I'll let them process a little bit. You know, again, you're stimulating their body. You're releasing emotion and trauma. So you've got to give them permission to have time to release that. Um, with cerebral palsy, if you're finding that spasticity coming out or the, um, the you know, it could be a, a petite seizure starting to happen, hands up for a while, you know, give it time and space. You're not, off, you're often not doing a lot during these sessions, but there's little bits, right? And so, again, most of the time it's about helping them understand something, what's going on. Um, in the present moment, in the last few weeks. Um, but again, you know, let the child jump from the table to the floor, walk out for a little bit, leave the door open, come back in when you're ready, um, let them fly. And then you'll avoid the meltdowns in clinic. So if, you fight, if you're really watching for that and you're allowing it, then you're not going to have, I, I can't remember the last time I had a meltdown in clinic. I'm going to touch wood on that because I bet I do now. Um, the other thing there is if you start noticing those signs of flight, then you need to shut up because the brain's starting to be overwhelmed and more talking at this point is going to send them into overwhelm. So really watch it. You know, their eyes will start to dart they'll um they'll shut down they'll they'll walk jerkily they'll want to get out of the room and this is at any age 
Um, so allow that space and allow them to just have, so again, with disabilities, a lot of the time, they need to play catch up on processing because there is so much to process. So, um, so I'll allow, you know, I'll do something and then I'll allow them to walk around or play or we'll go into a completely different tangent and talk about something completely different. I'm so sorry. I thought this was off. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll just allow that processing time. Um, it's, you know, another key thing is that we really, we're forming a relationship with, with a lot of these people. And it's, a, it's, I want my space to be a really comfortable, safe zone where they can just come and let life out rather than have to um, do better like a lot of the other therapies. The, a lot of the other therapies are places where they have to um, perform or reach a milestone or anything like that. My place is a place where they just come and really chill out and zone out. So I've got um, a girl with Down syndrome. She never rolls onto her front because that's too exposing. Um, the, uh, what, what I'll do, so we have a little... Um, uh, so we set 30 minutes is her session. So often with disabilities, 30 minutes are quite good. Um, I'll come back to that question in a minute. Um, I will have my laptop out and I put on Ed Sheeran on YouTube and she watches video clips of Ed Sheeran <laughs> while I work on her back and her body. Um, so she loves that and you find you just find things along the way of what works with them right um because you're talking you know she comes in she always has a carer but the carer doesn't come in the room um and she'll jump on the table she'll ask me how i'm going um you know and we'll have a little bit of a chat and you know again i'm just releasing tension from her body so often i'm working on her lower back where i get quite a fear response is what she originally came in for was her anxiety was getting quite heightened so again my role is to relax as much of the body as possible so that the vagus nerve can really kick in um and if you're putting them in that parasympathetic nervous system mode, you know, you're relaxing, you're breathing out for long periods of time, then you're able to process more, you're able to digest more, your anxiety goes down, all that kind of stuff. So I'm not, with her, I'm not working with um, past trauma or anything like that. I'm literally just giving her moments um, of unwinding her nervous system, you know, her tension, really, that's what I'm doing with her. So the difference between us as an, and a massage therapist is that we read the emotions behind it, but I'm not talking to her about things. Um, I'm literally just unwinding it. So every now and again, I'll be able to bring something up, but we don't talk, um, you know, she's got quite a, um, a severe intellectual disability as well. So we don't talk a lot about what's going on it's just literally bring up things and it, it if it has a space where it's heard then it feels better um with a i've got a 30 year old autistic man who um is has the intellectual ability of a seven year old so i treat him like a seven year old um as an adult still I, I still talk to him like an adult but as in the things that we talk about you know i'm talking to him about pokemon <laughs> life and we have a certain so he comes in i work on his feet first and then i say do you want your head or your hands next and often he'll go the hands because he loves his head being held and when you're working with um with the occiput this you know this is one of my favorite ways of working is you're holding this occiput and the you've got all the neurovasculars there you've got the cranio work that you can do there you've got um, the acupuncture points there 
but just holding the back of the head, bringing blood flow and warmth into the back of the head helps process things. And so he will fall asleep for a little bit and then he'll wake up and he'll be like, oh, I needed that thing. <laughs> and then he'll go. So again, half, half an hour. Um, uh, what else have I got there? So um, it's a similar sort of thing with cerebral palsy that hasn't been able to, you know, um, so I've got a child and they're prone all the time. Most of the time we're just trying to lessen this, the amount of seizures and spasms by that constant relaxing the nervous system work. So if you work neurovascularly, energetically with points, um, with fascia, it's all going to work. It's just um, it's what you use in order to calm the nervous system down. So don't worry about procedures or moving muscles or anything like that. We're just aiming at calming the nervous system. Um, how are we going? Any questions there? Have I kind of gone off tangent a little bit too much? Um, so I've got a question here about meltdowns. If they don't come back from the processing time, how do you finish a session if they don't want to? Um, I don't. I, I say to them, that's okay. We're finished for today, but you're going to come back in a week or two and we'll, we'll try again, okay? Um, and you make everything okay. Everything is okay in here. Um, there's no problem. So, again, they felt overwhelmed. They feel out of control. That's absolutely fine. Um, and if that happens, you know, there are some times I'm working with someone and um, we only get 15 minutes in the first four times because their fear response and their shame response is so heightened that, and that it's so overwhelming being in this new space that, um, that, you know, they can only get that far and they really don't want to come in but that's okay. You know, like I say, that's okay. You're, you're, you know, this is really normal for me. Um, you know, lots of people feel overwhelmed when they first come in or they feel frightened or they feel scared. Um, and that's okay. So we're going to just, we're going to sit here for a little bit. I'm going to massage your feet. Um, again, just allow them to, you know, do you want do your hands massage, do your feet massage? I'm just going to, you know, Sorry, I'm just going to gently work with your body um, and relax your body. So often they're sitting on the couch with mum or with a carer um, and or dad, you know, and I'm working with them um, while they're there and they won't let me do anything else other than massage their wrist for 15 minutes and then they're out the door. Um, so I price accordingly to that. Um, I'll talk about the NDIS and stuff in a minute. Um, but if they have a meltdown and it's gone, that's fine. Come back, make sure you rebook them in. And again, this is the biggest thing with disabilities. You know, you got to see yourself as part of their team now. They're rarely going to come in for one or two sessions. You, you know, we're, we're a place where they can come and unwind. Um, it's a really beautiful space to work in. So, NDIS. Um, where do I begin with NDIS? <laughs> um, we don't have to register for anything. So, um, if you've got an ABN, um, they can claim you. Um, the, the biggest obstacle that we have is what to put us under. So, I've called NDIS. I've gotten a really clear picture, um, really clear thing, uh, statement that has always worked for me. Um, so you've got self-managed, plan-managed and agency-managed, right? So we have really have nothing in private practice. You don't really have anything to do with agency-managed. That's, um, that's your homes and, and things like that. So we are often under self-managed or agency-managed. So self-managed, what will happen is that they pay you and then they claim back through their provider. Agency managed, you're sending that invoice to the agency that's handling the finances and they will generally pay you 
look, it can it differs. Like it can be two days, it can be two weeks. It just kind of depends. Um, so that's really so they have a certain amount allocated for different things, um, and you're just invoicing either the agency or the person right there and then. Um, so what will often happen is that if they're self-managed, you just, again, you're just giving them this. So we are daily activity capacity building. So if you go on the NDIS um, website, they've got 11 topics, I guess, of things that you claim under. Um, so when they're allocated money, you will, um, they'll have different allocations for all those things. Um, so we are under daily activity capacity building. It's a really broad general thing. Um, so we're therapeutic support for psychosocial symptoms. So daily activity capacity building as we are therapeutic support for psychosocial symptoms. So if you break that down, we help them on a daily basis for things that stress them out <laughs> and we're therapeutic support for that. Um, so, you know, really a lot of the time it's for the, for managing their anxieties um, and for helping them um, communicate and with their relationships. So sometimes with an agency, you know, not all the time, sometimes, and it's normally more those, um, developmental um, disabilities, you know, so, you know, if there's a child with, um, I've got a child with intellectual delay, it's not really, it's because they've had a cleft palate. Um, so we're helping him learn how to speak. Um, and so he, he's, he's, he, we have to update things every six months because it's something that should progressively get better. But for disabilities which don't get better, um, I haven't usually needed to do a report. But again, it depends on the agency, right? So and literally the report says we're working on this for this. And, you know, I suggest coming in. So always overestimate so that they have the funds there um, ready to go. Um, so. Um, sorry, I've just got some questions. Um, so I will, um, I'll send that off prior. It depends on how urgent it is. So if, if you're really working with severe anxiety or there's, or there's a pressing issue, I will see them first and then work out the funding later. Again, it depends on your practice. Um, but most of the time, I will say, look, this is what I claim it under. Um, check with your agency, get approval. If I need a report, um, you know, I will, um, I can provide that. And then we get approval and then they come in for their first session. Um, or they come in for a session, they pay, they, they figure out whether they like me or not. And we go from there. Um, yeah, so always overestimate. Some industries have a habit of over, you know, they, they add extra to their, um, to their consults for NDIS. I don't like this. Um, I, you know, some people, some people do, and that's absolutely fine. I know it's more effort. I know it's more, um, the reality is, is that the, there's often not a lot of funding. So yes, it sounds like a big amount, but there's a big amount to spend it on. And if every therapist is charging more for that consult, their funding runs out really quickly. So it's really important to, to work within that scope for them, I think. Um, so I just charge them the regular price. Um, but yeah, so, so is that any, all the other questions for as far as NDIS is concerned? Um, as long as you've got an ABN and a qualification. Um, there is an NDIS check that 
has kind of come through. So it's like a working with children's check, but you'll need one. Um, but there is a disabilities uh, check that's coming through as well. So it kind of started in February. It doesn't seem to affect us yet, but it's just something to be aware of that we might need in the future. Um, so you go into your state government website and um, and that will uh, have have the information you need, like a disabilities check. Um, okay, so I'm just trying to decipher a question here. Managing parents who report, oh, the kids don't want to come to appointments. Um, usually they don't want to come because they don't understand what's going on. It, most of the time, if a child understands what's going on, if they feel like they can trust you to listen to them and communicate with them and respect their wishes, then they're going to want to come back. Um, if they really don't want to, then they don't want to. That's fine. I'm, I'm here when you're ready. Um, they might find somebody else and that's okay. Um, what else do I have to say? Guys, how, how are we going? Do you have any questions? Um, I know it's a lot of information first, but really coming back to that sense that kinesiology isn't about the muscle testing. Kinesiology is about helping the body communicate what's, what it's feeling and, and what's going on and releasing tension. That's our biggest thing. We, we are here to release tension. Um, I, you know, I, I talk a little bit about disabilities in my kinesiology for kids course. Um, so that's a six week course um, online. It's, this will be the, so I'm running it in August again. This will be the sixth time running it. Um, so in that I go through all the developmental stages of a child and um, emotional and physical and spiritual. Um, so working straight from babies, um, so newborns straight through to adults and each week we go through a new age group. I love that course. I'm really, really proud of it. Um, on the practitioner table. So my other business is, a, is the practitioner table. It's the practitioner table.com. It's business support and mentorship for practitioners. Um, I could because I really just want practitioners to feel confident out in the world, you know, coming from student to practitioner is massive. So there's free info, but I've also got a membership there and the membership is, um, you know, it's under $20 a month. And at the moment it's got um, how to work with trauma, including suicide. It's got <clears throat> how to work with eating disorders. It's got how-tos for setting up business online and all that kind of stuff. Um, my next one I'm, I'm in the process of putting together is cerebral palsy. I'll be talking a lot about that there and helping you uh, negotiate that. Um, the other point I wanted to make for disabilities is that you will learn so much from being really open to learning. Um, from these people, you know, um, most of what I've learned has come from talking to the parents and being really open with, with, okay, I don't understand that. Can you show me how that works? What happens here? Can you talk to me about that? Um, and then just being, you know, allowing the space for them to, um, to talk about all the different areas, you know, with kids as well, often what you're doing is, you're working uh, with the parents' trauma and grief as well. So set aside different sessions for them. But sometimes just as I'm doing body work, I'm talking to mum about what's going on in all the different therapies and things. So I've become a bit of a sounding board, uh, a place to put together all of the things, <laughs> really. Um some things to be aware of. I'm just trying to think. There's there's so many different things. Um, but do we know, you know, okay, when you're working with 
um, seizures, if there's a seizure in your clinic, um, if, if they're regular seizures, most of the time, you know, within that, what will happen is that they'll have a grand mal. Um, if they have a grand mal, they'll fall to the ground. If you remove everything near their head um, and their body and you just try and give them space for the seizure to finish, it can be quite scary. Um, but you allow them to seizure. And then <clears throat> usually the next 20 minutes is... Um, like recuperation time, so they'll be quite confused for a while. They'll, they'll ask you what's happened. And then you just allow them space to sit and process. Um, if within that, you know, if it gets to kind of that 15 minute mark and they're not recovering, um, then I will call the ambulance. Um, People, again, this is more like an epileptic thing than a seizure thing, but with a disabilities thing, but people with epilepsy, if they get called to the ambulance and they're not allowed to drive for the next year, so they can be quite upset with you if you've called the ambulance. Um, you know, like, I, I will always call the ambulance if I want to and need to, regardless of how upset they get with me. You know, if they have a seizure on the road, then that's, you know, that's not okay. Um, but, you know, I, I have had people get quite upset because I've done that. Um, and they've been close to a year, you know, of driving. Um, but if they're regular seizures and they're fine, um, if the ambulance does arrive, sometimes I'll just walk in and walk out again. You're fine. Okay, away we go. Um, without taking their Medicare card. Um, what else? Um, again, you know, just, just really working on relaxing that nervous system. Um, I think, you know, I think that's kind of everything. For, well, wow, okay, it's, it's 10.24 and I do have a 10.30 client. <laughs> but um, I think that's a lot of information for now. <laughs> I have so much more to share with you. So if you have any questions, let me know. Um, you can ask questions in the practitioner table or you can email me directly um, as well. Um, I have the Kinesiology for Kids course coming up. I have the membership. I have mentoring. I have a group membership uh, mentoring coming up as well. So make sure you check out the um, practitionertable.com. If that, that's small groups of eight and we talk about different things coming up, I talk a lot more if you don't have case studies yet. Um, we just got talk about what's going on in your business, in your emotional state, um, what's going on for clients. And we just, we, it's a really beautiful, supportive little um, group. Um, so, you know, I have so much support for you guys. You're not alone in this. Um, there's so much to learn. But really, my main point here is take your time be open to everything, watch for signs, work with that person. Don't get caught up in doing specific things um, and learn a lot along the way. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Um, if you have anything else, let me know. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>